Uh, today, the Summit Old Guard welcomes Grace Ann Taylor, who, who will speak to us about the ongoing efforts and accomplishments in, in protecting and preserving Barnegat Bay. During high school, Grace Ann attended the first graduating class of the Ocean County, New Jersey Mar Marine Academy of Technology and Environmental Science. She then studied at Stony Brook University near the water on the North Shore of Long Island and graduated with a degree in marine science. Her passions for educating others about Barnegat Bay began as an intern at the Sedge Island Nat Natural Resource Education Center, as well as serving with AmeriCorps as the Barnegat Bay Watershed Ambassador. In those capacities, she gained hands-on experience in multiple facets of the extensive watershed while performing scientific research and doing environmental education. Since joining Save Barnegat Bay about five years ago as education and outreach coordinator, Grace Ann has spoken before numerous groups, including the Forked River, New Jersey Old Guard, which is nearby her, that area, as well as uh, conducting volunteer programs to help ignite passion and foster conservation of the bay and its surrounding watershed. Grace Ann, welcome. Thanks everyone. I am excited to bring this presentation to you and you are the first group to get our new and upgraded uh, PowerPoint presentation with all kinds of amazing graphics and things. Um, I'm really excited to talk with you all and I'm so thrilled that there's so many of you here. And uh, what I've decided is that um, I really love to have um, interaction throughout my presentations uh, because it sometimes feels like I'm talking to a wall on these Zoom calls. Um, so if you'd like to say something, we'll put it in the chat first. That way I can kind of monitor it a little bit. I'll check it after each slide. And that way we can kind of have like a balance. I can have a little bit of interaction and still be able to get through um, the presentation. So I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna present this. Um, hopefully this goes as smoothly as it can. There's a, a video or two, um, but we are very excited to have just celebrated our 50th anniversary at Save Barnegat Bay. So we have a new and upgraded logo for any of you who might be familiar with our Virgie. And um, as Roger so kindly introduced me, I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator at Save Barnegat Bay. And I'm surrounded by an amazing staff of other women. It happens to just all be women. Um, and we have been working on this mission. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we've been working, ooh, sorry. We've been working on this mission for over 50 years now, um, founded in 1971. And we started as a chapter of the Isaac Walton League of America, for those of you who might be familiar with that group. And in my recent research of that group, our values still stand true to that group as well. So while we are our own 501c3 nonprofit, and we are officially our own organization, our values still align with um, the Isaac Walton League in that we're still um, you know, bringing on conservationists and hunters, fishers, local stakeholders, um, people who grow shellfish in the bay, people that have businesses in and around the watershed and municipal people and all these different folks sit around our table. And so that brings me to the point that we are nonpartisan. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you sit on. Um, we have, in fact, Republicans and Democrats on our board um, and within our circle of influence and members. So it's really important to us that we're constantly talking with everyone um, throughout the community because we all live here. And our main goal is to be a strong and independent voice for Barnegat Bay, of course. Um, so we're mainly funded by donations over the past 50 years, which makes us able to be very independent um, in that we're not influenced by major uh, sponsorships or anything of that nature. In recent years, we've taken a few grants from the DEP um, in regards to the money uh, handed out for Barnegat Bay, which I'm gonna get into in a few minutes. And this is the lovely executive director, Britta Forsberg, pictured here at a, um, uh, Barnegat Bay Blitz. It was a, um, an event where we uh, do a big cleanup. And so she was asked to introduce some of the beginning activities that day. And I just love this picture of her. Um, so a uh, little bit about our organization now. In the past five years since working there, um, we have moved into a beautiful location 
in Tom's River at 117 Haynes Road. Some of you might be familiar with it if you've heard of Brown's Woods and it's Green Acres property. So it's kind of like a park, but not quite. Um, the land was conserved for open space and recreation and we rent the space within the fenced in area um, from the township of Tom's River. And along the property and within that 40 acres, we are bordered by the Tom's River. We have the Long Swamp Creek running between in between our property. We have this beautiful outdoor classroom, which I have more pictures of for you to see called River Time. And since then, we've installed things like a greenhouse, native plant gardens. Seasonally, we install rain barrels and we have a brand new uh, community science water quality lab inside the building. And so when you arrive here at the Eco Center, we're hoping that you are able to see things that you can do to protect Barnegat Bay. But the cool thing about all of our solutions is that really it's not just applicable to Barnegat Bay. All the issues and reasons for the things that we're doing are applicable across the state of New Jersey and even beyond that. Because many of the problems that our estuaries and our coastal waterways and our rivers and creeks and streams are um, experiencing are all rooted in the same problems. So this is a beautiful photo that um, I took a few weeks ago when we had that big snowstorm down here at the shore and it just, uh, the eco center is kind of magical all the time, but especially in the snow. Here is a more um, everyday picture. Uh, we have a mural um, that that young woman uh, got to paint on the wall with her mom as a part of a Girl Scout project. And we have the beautiful um, River Time classroom, which was built by Ocean County Corrections and their amazing support and talent. And the rest of the Eco Center has all kinds of other magical things to come and visit. So I highly encourage you to stop by if you're down in Tom's River. Um, so let's talk about the Barnegat Bay watershed. So really quickly, I just want to define watershed is a land area that drains into a common body of water. And so no matter where you are on the planet, you're always standing in a watershed. So let's start from left to right here. On the far left, you have a picture of New Jersey. And as you can see, it's broken up into 20 watershed management areas, not to be confused with wildlife management areas. Unfortunately, sometimes we make names for things that are just very confusing for a regular person that's not doing this every day. Um, but a WMA or watershed management area, there are 20 in New Jersey uh, at this uh, scale, basically. And Barnegat Bay is located in number 13, which is right here on the coast. And if I take away that picture, it makes it a little easier to see. So if you look in, if you look at this middle image, there's a black line that goes all the way around. This is Ocean County's border. And I always explain that government borders, county, state, what have you, municipalities are often straight lines because people drew a line on a map and decided which side of the, you know, which side of the land they were going to have jurisdiction over. But the difference for a watershed boundary, which is this squiggly line that you see here, is a natural boundary um, on the face of the earth. It's actually on the surface of the ground. And in this, where this kind of line is, it's a ridge. So the land is slightly higher there. And so any water that lands on either side of that ridge will roll in either direction. So if water lands on the outside of this watershed, it will roll west towards the Delaware River. And of course, as you can see on this right image, if it lands on the east side of that ridge, it will drain towards our rivers, creeks, and streams, and then into Barnegat Bay. Now, just a quick kind of little orientation. This red section up here is the Matita Conk River, so you might be familiar with Lakewood, Brick, Jackson, Point Pleasant. Then this yellow section is the Tom's River, the actual river, not the town. And so the, the town of Tom's River is down here, but the river itself goes all the way up to Six Flags Great Adventure right here on the edge of our um, watershed boundary. And so parts of the Toms River run up into Jackson, Manchester, Whiting, and Lakehurst is in there. And then even uh, all the towns along the southern part of the Toms River, like Pine Beach, Ocean Gate, Beechwood. Um, and so all these towns are all influencing the one river. And then all 37 towns in our watershed are influencing the bay. So as you can see, we have four towns that kind of have little pieces of them draining into Barnegat Bay from Monmouth County. And then we have all this other land, which are 33 municipalities in Ocean County that drain into Barnegat Bay. 
And so they're all a part of our story about talking about the idea of conserving and protecting Barnegat Bay. So really quick, I love this image on the right because it just shows how wet our watershed is and really just how much water there is. And there's a bit of water that you can't see on this map, which is the groundwater, where most of us here in South Jersey get our drinking water from. With the exception of the folks who live right up here on the Matita Conk River and get their water from the Brick Reservoir, all of us down South Ocean County and, and most, frankly, most of Ocean County get our water from the Kirkwood Cohansey Aquifer and other smaller aquifers in the um, in the ground. And so every drop of water, every bit of the aquifer, all the rivers, creeks and streams, all the rainwater, all of it is draining into Barnegat Bay. And really quick, an intro to Barnegat Bay. Barnegat Bay is the largest body of water in the state of New Jersey. It goes from a town called Bay Head, or the head of the bay up here, all the way down to Little Egg Harbor. So it's about 41 miles long, and on average, it's only six feet deep. So most of you are probably taller than the average depth of Barnegat Bay. So what does that mean? It's like a giant shallow cookie sheet, and it's being influenced by ocean water from the Manasquan Inlet, the Barnegat Inlet, and the Little Egg Inlet, and it's being influenced by all the fresh water on the west side draining into it. So this really shallow cookie sheet of an estuary is being influenced by salt and fresh water, which is called brackish water when it mixes in the middle. And that's what creates our estuary. And that shallow bay is what makes it really, really important for all the fish and birds on the eastern seaboard to migrate up and down and be able to stop in our estuary to reproduce or find food. And so just a quick draw into our lives as people here. Um, obviously, you know that everyone comes down the shore for the summer. And so this area doubles in population. So we go from 600,000 people to over a million in the summer. And so uh, without our beautiful Barnegat Bay and the health of our waterways here, um, our economy would start to break down. And so would our ecosystems, which um, feed into our economy and our fishing industry, our tourism industry, and of course, um, all the things in between. So um, this is, you all know the water cycle, the water goes up, water comes down, and it should go in a circle. Uh, but basically, what's happening more often than not in our in these kind of suburban urban areas, which I'll get into, you know, kind of us having that here, is um, what we call the urban water cycle. And so instead of water just going up and coming down, it's being interrupted by what we call impervious surfaces or roads, sidewalks, roofs, parking lots, driveways, basically anything that's paved in such a way that doesn't allow water to pass through it. So previously, before we built up this area or any area, the, our sandy soils here at the coast would allow water to drain through them and into the aquifer, as I was mentioning before. But now, instead, it's landing on these hard surfaces and draining into our storm drains, which we've designed this way. And then our storm drains pipe that water directly out into our rivers, creeks, and streams. And so instead of it going down into our aquifer, it's being redirected straight into our rivers, creeks, and streams, which, as you have experienced in your life, is causing some some hiccups, such as roadway flooding, if things are backed up, um, streams and other places are flooding. And obviously the part that I'm sure you're going <laughs> to guess I'm going to get into is the stuff that is carried by that stormwater into our waterways. So what is stormwater? I keep using that word. It's basically just rain or snow. It's water that falls from the sky and lands on the ground. We call it stormwater. And so you can see here all examples of stormwater that's kind of backed up, built up. And I would be hard pressed to hear, I'm sure it would be hard to, um, to find one of you that hasn't experienced some kind of flooding event in your time um, because it's just so frequent for every single person, um, especially living here in, at, in New Jersey where we have such a wet state. So the stormwater is a problem for lots of reasons. Um, obviously, it runs off your roof, it runs off your driveway, your sidewalk, your lawn, and with it carries all kinds of icky things. So I put this graphic here, I stole it from an organization in Virginia off of Google, um, but I loved how succinct it was, and it really focuses on a residence impact um, and so even though residents are not the only reason that we have stormwater problems, um, 
in Ocean County, we have a million residents. And I, I caught that chat thing. I'll grab that in a second. Um, so uh, in Ocean County, we have over a million people here in the summer. And most people live on a um, kind of residential space. And so in Ocean County, we don't really have what we call like these large industrial influences to the pollution problems that we have. It's really more spread out, which makes it that much harder to control and deal with because it's really so many individual uh, situations as opposed to like one industry that we can point to and say, you know, you're in fact the, the, you know, kind of source of the pollution. Um, and I believe Edward sounds like he wants to ask a question. So I just want to take a breath and ask if you have a question, Edward. Um, did you work with Pete McLean and did you work on the Osprey and Barnegat Bay and kayaking? Um, yes, actually, I met Pete McLean. I didn't work with him, but I did meet him once before he passed away. And I did work at the Sedge Island Natural Resource Education Center and um, had the privilege of working in the Sedge Island Marine Conservation Zone where Pete kind of made his, um, his way. And that was when I fell in love with Barnegat Bay. Ironically, now, as an educator for Barnegat Bay, I talk a whole lot more about the stuff going on on the land than I do about the uh, critters in the water, because so much of protecting the critters in the water takes place um, on the bay. Yes, I appreciate that segue. Um, so just to give you, I don't put a bunch of slides in here because there's actually quite a few more slides that are not about this, but I just want to get into it really quick. Um, those of you from all different parts of New Jersey um, would probably have different uh, perspectives on this uh, from your experience. But in Ocean County, our wastewater system and our stormwater system are different. So I'm going to say that again because it's, it's really very important. Our stormwater system, i.e. the drains that come off the roads, sidewalks, roofs, parking lots, things like that, are separate and not a part of our wastewater system. And so our wastewater system is the water you flush down your toilet, you use in your shower, anywhere there's a drain, if you're not on septic. If you're on septic, there's a container underneath your house basically that's allowing that um, wastewater to get somehow, um, you know, move through some kind of media to get some kind of filtration process going on and it's underneath of your home. If you're um, connected to city infrastructure, you're on the wastewater system that heads the pipes out to our wastewater treatment plant, which is handled at the county level. And then they treat that water and it goes out into the ocean. And so I'm gonna get into a project in a few minutes that kind of highlights what we're doing to try and address some of those differences. So just wanted to make that clarification. Thank you for that segue. Um, and yes, absolutely. Road salt is definitely, um, a, a component of the pollution here. We don't think about it very often because we're so often thinking about, oh, we're down at the shore, it's summer, we're walking our dog and washing our car and, and fertilizing our lawn, but definitely in the wintertime, road salt is a problem. Um, so obviously uh, there's some things that residents can't uh, be a part of the solution immediately with their behaviors to do with their homes. But we're gonna talk about ways that you can get involved with your community to help influence better decisions made at the uh, municipal level. But just before I get back to the good news, there are a few more bad news bears things I have to share. Um, in New Jersey, uh, well, in all of the United States, we have this thing called the Clean Water Act. And that was um, written and passed in 1972, right after Save Barnegat Bay was established as an organization. And basically, uh, the Clean Water Act, long story short, across all this crazy bureaucratic insanity. There's this thing called a 303D list. And the name of that is up in the type, top right corner of the screen. Almost irrelevant. All you need to know is that it's what's called our impaired waters. It basically, the 303D list outlines water that is not healthy. And so New Jersey has its own list, obviously. And uh, the DEP manages that list and the EPA looks it over, et cetera, et cetera. This list is from 2014, and they're supposed to be updated every two years. I believe the 2016 one, and 2018 one, and 2021, and now we're at 2022. I don't know how backed up we are, but this is the last one I have a good visual for. Um, as far as backed up, as far as the DEP getting those that information um, 
sanctioned and, and put out into the world because it has to go back and forth from all these bureaucratic gates and what have you. Anyway, so this is a very busy looking graph, but all you have to find are the two arrows. Uh, the Toms River Estuary, uh, which is obviously a part of Barnegat Bay, does not pass for all of the sections that it should. So the Clean Water Act states that water should stay the same or get better. Um, and so in regards to supporting aquatic life, supporting recreation, fish, you know, swimming and, and playing and, and sailing and boating, um, supporting the ability to eat shellfish. So that means not getting sick if you eat the animals. Um, and obviously also fish, fin fish in the other category of that. So fishable, swimmable are the words used in the Clean Water Act. And as you can see, Barnegat Bay fails in a lot of sections in the north and there's insufficient data in other places, which basically doesn't help us at all because it just means that the data is not good in either direction and it could be failing. Um, and the Toms River fails all the way across. Um, and so let's, before we get into all the projects that Save Barnegat Bay is working on to try and address the exact problem I just uh, described, I just want to take a quick segue into talking about native plants. Um, because I don't really have a lot of space in the rest of the presentation to talk about it. So New Jersey native plants are a great way to help filter the storm water that's instead of making its way out into the bay, it's going to make its way into our soil. And so um, we have, um, I'll get to you, Joe, I got your question. Um, so in New Jersey, grasses that we use on our lawns tend to be very short roots, um, very shallow roots here. And as you can see, um, they don't go very deep. And so water, in order to get it deep into the ground throughout the soil and back into the aquifer, they need to be deeper. Grass is often planted on compacted soil and fill. And so it's not really doing a job it's almost as bad, if not worse, than in a lot of ways than impervious surfaces like roads, sidewalks, roofs, and parking lots. Not only because it doesn't absorb water, but because we have to address it with so many chemicals and fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides. So not only is it not doing its job, it's also creating more havoc. Um, and so the rest of the plants on this picture you can see have nice long root systems and they also provide habitat on the surface for birds and bees and pollinators and, and animals and things. So basically a giant lawn of grass as I look out on my, of the, there's a field in front of my apartment building. It's pretty much a dead zone for most animals. There's a few birds that can use it once in a while. Um, but this section in like in the woods off to the side of um, the area, even though it's full of invasives, that's where all the birds live. That's where all the, the insects live. That's where everything needs to um, survive. So, okay, so it's just taken a minute to advance. So we don't want grass, but we do want New Jersey native plants. And at the end of the presentation, I can put in the chat a great place to start if you're wondering how to purchase those. Um, there's a resource that you can find um, that one of our partners developed that allows you to find all the native plant nurseries in the state of New Jersey. Um, so. To answer the, there was a good question. I just want to get to it. Um, have we introduced oysters growing to improve water quality? So Save Barnegat Bay is just an advocacy and education group. So we're very grassroots nonprofit, very small staff. Um, but we often will try to help oyster growers by making sure that they try, you know, try to help them get their permits, try to help promote their businesses, try to, um, you know, literally hire them to come to our fundraisers and stuff so that they gain exposure and they sell their product. Um, and they, the oyster growers, the folks who are growing oysters to sell to the local restaurants are definitely contributing to a positive eco economic growth in this area. And those oysters are definitely going to improve the water quality. The only catch is that in order to grow oysters to sell, which is the main thing that we can do here in New Jersey. Um, because there's a lot of laws that stop us from doing more than that. Um, is that the water kind of has to be clean and healthy to begin with in order for us to grow oysters to eat or else we'd get sick. Um, and so there's more places in Barnegat Bay that are being open to grow oysters. And there's a lot more oyster growers now than there ever have been. 
um, because the ecosystem kind of evolved from being a place where there were wild oysters and oyster reefs into a place where there's a lot more um, artificial oyster growers. The good news is that oysters reproduce in the water. And so if they find a nice place to settle once they're reproducing, the oyster growers and the folks growing our food in the cages will encourage wild oyster habitat to, to happen around in areas where it might be kind of beneficial and might be a good um, environment for those oysters to grow naturally. Um, uh, sorry, my thing is being silly. Um, what is the scale on the y-axis of the plant? Um, so yeah, it's a little blurry. Basically, grassroots can be all of a few inches. So like pretty much my hand, if you can see kind of the width of my hand. Um, whereas these native plant roots can grow down quite a few feet. I don't have exact numbers, but that's um, about a range. Yeah, so weeds is one of those words that drives me nuts because it actually has no meaning in real life. It's like my my partner loves to cook and I'll say, I'll say the word um, curry and he'll yell at me because he'll be like, curry doesn't mean anything. Curry is it's just like saying sauce in English. And so it really doesn't have like a, a meaning. Weed doesn't have a meaning. It's basically relative to you. So whatever you consider not good is a weed. But in fact, a lot of weeds that we think are not good are native plants um, and you can't buy in a nursery. So you can buy as many plants as you, as you want to from a nursery, but allowing that natural um, accretion of seeds and plants over time is going to be much more beneficial to the ecosystem. Um, I don't know that resource, American Meadows, Wildflowers. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. So they could be feet. Yeah. I don't usually focus on the that kind of detail, but could be for sure. All right. Um, I'll just put, while we're talking about it, I'll just put um, that resource in the chat. Uh, Jersey Yards. Sorry, I was putting the whole name. Jerseyyards.org is a website that has nurseries listed across the state of New Jersey that sell native plants. Um, and so they absorb stormwater, they absorb nutrients and before it ends up in Barnegat Bay and any other waterway and they increase habitat, they increase water quality or the health of the water. So it's just all around good. So um, I'm not gonna get into all of the ways that you can use native plants and green infrastructure, which is basically um, just a fancy way to say, we're gonna mimic nature, we're gonna build things to mimic nature. Um, but I did put this slide in there because they can be beautiful uh, solutions to flooding issues and you know, trying to increase uh, just you know, beauty, water absorption, um, you know, reduce flooding, things like that. So these are all some version of a rain garden. There's all kinds of other technical names for the things in the pictures, but frankly, I wouldn't even get lost in that. They be, all they do is they absorb water from the storms um, and they're plants that encourage native wildlife. Um, so if you are designing a rain garden, I have lots of resources on that. So huge left turn. Uh, Say Barnegat Bay is working on a few really large initiatives to try and help save Barnegat Bay, right, in, in this effort. So um, I started with the big flashy one to start. We produced a movie for our 50th anniversary, and it goes into the, the main character of the movie is Barnegat Bay. There are five stories, um, and it really goes into the uh, story of 50 years of trying to save Barnegat Bay. So um, kind of 50 years ago, the kinds of things and feels, you know, stories that existed then into where we are now. So if you allow me, I'll just play the trailer because it is so exciting. Um, and then I'll talk about after, if you'd like to see the film, how you can do that. How about now? Yes. Perfect. We got it. You know, the planet only has so much to give. Population of Ocean County went from 180,000 people to 600,000 people. You have a tributary right there along Swamp Creek. That's the worst tributary of any stream that goes into Barnegat Bay. It's like becoming like a big bathtub. I wish he were here today because he'd be knocking houses down today, you know, taking out the bulkhead. This is going to be really bad. You know, it's probably a 50 50 chance that I'm not going to have a shop. All of a sudden, you open your eyes and you're like, 
They're everywhere. How did we miss this? We're, we're not at war of the environment and the economy. That is just so over. People come and they're like oblivious to the fact that there's an environment. All of what happens in the Barnegat Bay watershed affects the bay. The changing conditions, the natural conditions in the bay are starting to accelerate. The question is, you know, have we reached a tipping point? Because we're in such a constant changing environment, both naturally, politically, culturally, our work is never done. You know, the planet only has so much to give. What you love is going to be gone. Oh, every time Jim says that, I cringe. <laughs> um, so I just need to get the toolbar out of my way so I can actually see what I'm doing. Um, and I'm going to full screen this. Hopefully you can see it properly. Okay. So um, we produced a film. It's called Drift. Uh, and you can sign up to have it screened for your organization or group. Uh, there's some talk about possibly bringing it here to Old Guard. But if we can't bring it here to Old Guard, um, you can sign up to see it at any of our partner organizations. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, awesome. So if you'd like to uh, learn more about the film, there are five stories. Um, the five stories do include Pete McLean, for those folks who might remember or know Pete um, and his story. He is highlighted in a full segment of the five. Um, and then there's another segment about jellyfish and the nuclear power plant. Another segment about how the watersheds compare to each other, Tom's River versus the Cedar Creek. And uh, there's another segment about Beaton's Boatyard and their history on Barnegat Bay and their, the way they were impacted by Sandy and their just family history of building beautiful boats on Barnegat Bay. Um, and then the final section is a round table of uh, female conservation artists, including me and my boss, Britta, um, which uh, is a kind of a discussion, kind of a round table open discussion about where we are in the kind of history of, of conservation and where we feel like we're moving going forward. Get this to advance. There we go. So um, definitely the movie is one of the more exciting things that we're working on. Um, but all of our projects are really exciting. So we have another project called Rally for Barnegat Bay. And before I was addressing the difference between stormwater and wastewater. In this project, we're partnering with Clean Ocean Action. The DEP gave us some money to do the project. And also the Marine Academy of Technology and Environmental Science, my high school, if you were paying attention at the beginning, um, which is really very cool that I get to work with my teachers and educators as colleagues and peers now. Um, but all of us are teaming up to try and find and fix pathogen pollution in the Toms River. So what does that mean? Um, so basically, when we say find and fix, uh, finding and fix, finding is really the biggest and most in-depth part of this project. So you'll notice there's an adorable black dog featured on the right side. There are actually two different dogs in the pictures. Um, but uh, Remy is the name of the dog. And the, the most exciting piece of this project is that we're using poop sniffing dogs to find human poo, which is basically when I say the word pathogen, what I mean is human poo, um, in places where possibly accidentally wastewater pipes are leaking into stormwater pipes. Um, and so underground, our infrastructure is getting old. And so in a lot of ways, we need to... Um, be addressing these old infrastructure problems because there's leaks from one into the other. Uh, and so our systems are supposed to be separate, but sometimes they're, you know, causing cross-contamination. So our student grants, which I'll talk about later, are contributing to science. So there's young people, scientists going out and collecting water samples and doing tests. And then those water samples and tests are influencing where we bring the poop sniffing dog named Remy. And then she did her work. And then now Clean Ocean Action and the lab um, and all the scientists involved are working um, with the six towns to share that information with them and hopefully find figure out a way to fix those infrastructure problems. So the six towns involved are Beachwood, Pine Beach, Ocean Gate, um, South Toms River, Toms River, Island Heights. I think that's everybody. I might have missed one. But all those six towns are basically around the basin of the Toms River. Um, are there any areas still using septic tanks or cesspools? Um, 
I don't actually know how to define what a cesspool is and a septic tank. I'm sure there's folks that use septic tanks, but in this region, it's less likely a septic issue and more likely um, a contamination from the wastewater systems um, is what we're finding so far. So we absolutely love Remy, but more importantly too, we absolutely love our Department of Public Works folks because uh, they are huge players in this, in this um, project. We cannot do this without them. We need them to help us go out there and move manholes aside and know the streets and the maps of the town and how they're built and where things are connected. We have uh, partners at the Ocean County Waste Manage, or excuse me, the Ocean County Wastewater System, you know, people who work in that system are, are partnering on this project because all of our municipal infrastructure feeds into our county infrastructure as far as water is concerned, wastewater is concerned. So our, our boots on the ground, literally and figuratively, um, we can't do this without the, the buy-in and partnership from the six towns. And so we're very appreciative of them. Um, so that's one project that we're working on. Um, another project that we're working on is called Stop the Sting. Uh, this project is also a partnership with my high school, which is kind of cool, and the uh, money from the DEP. So basically, all this money came out for Barnegat Bay, and Save Barnegat Bay, along with our partners, applied for a few of the grants. Believe it or not, $10 million was earmarked for Barnegat Bay, and Save Barnegat Bay, we did not get very much of it. So don't worry, we didn't steal all the money. There's tons of organizations around the watershed that are doing great work. Um, but in this project, we are working with a local public safety dive team. So Berkeley Township Underwater Search and Rescue is a public safety all volunteer dive team, um, which full disclosure, I happen to also be a member there because <laughs> I don't know how to stay still. Um, and so uh, the local dive team is helping us address the very significant jellyfish problem because they have interesting boats, skills, and technical ability to help us do that. So um, on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see a picture of the bay nettle. Um, the bay nettle is related to the sea nettle. So if you've heard those words interchangeably, uh, basically the animal, from, from if you are looking at the animal, it's going to be very hard for you to tell the difference between the two of them. Um, but the bay nettle is really, um, genetically speaking, by its DNA, the one more prolifically found in Barnegat Bay. Um, and so the point of this project is to collect data and prove that the technique of how we're taking care of the jellyfish is working. We want to educate lagoon homeowners. And so when we say lagoon, it's all those folks that live right on the edge of the bay. Um, in communities where neighborhoods are on old marshes. Um, I got that question, I'll grab it. Um, yes, exactly. So um, basically the last bullet here says, an increase of health and water will decrease the bay nettles. And the reason the bay nettles are taking over is because they are thriving in the low water quality. And when I say water quality, it's just a fancy way for me to say water health. So the jellyfish really like bad water quality. They're good at it. They are more apt to survive. Their prey is slowed down because it's not healthy. Um, and so they're able to eat more. And the jellyfish in Barnegat Bay are the top of the food chain. They eat everything in sight. Um, they eat everything from fish to larval crabs and oysters and clams and whatever's in their path. Um, they can go after. And so um, I'm realizing now as I'm giving this presentation that we're missing a very significant partner on the logos. Montclair State University is the science arm of this project. So Dr. Paul Bologna, who you saw speak for a few seconds in the trailer of our film, um, he is the lead scientist on this project. He's at a sanctioned university. So all the work that we're doing is influenced by his science that's been done on Barnegat Bay for years. Um, and now is being um, addressed here in our lagoon communities in Barnegat Bay. And so I need to add their logo here. So I'm, I'm addressing that as, I'm, as we're moving through this. Um, and so I have one more slide here. So we're gonna be working on this project in Brick, Toms River, and Bayville, um, three towns to start. And uh, we start in, started in Bayville this year because the dive team lives in Bayville. Um, and what we're doing is we're scrubbing bulkheads. So what Paul Bologna and his students over the years have found is that this particular jellyfish 
lives on plastic material most prolifically. So plastic bulkheads, floating docks, things of that nature. So we want to scrub those surfaces and try to remove those surfaces whenever possible in the winter time so that we can disturb the polyp stage. So what I'd like to share with you is a video here of what scrubbing actually looks like, because before it was done, it was very hard for people to visualize what the heck we were doing. But we're in a lagoon community in Bayville, and I'm muting it because I was just kind of shouting about the inability to get on the, I'm like laying on the ground to get this image. Um, and so basically where we are, you can see the dive team boat is on the left side with my chief and everyone kind of out there getting everything set up and the scrubbers who are, um, sometimes they're divers, but in this case, they don't need to be divers. Um, they're going in there with brushes and they're physically disturbing the, um, the surface. You see, there's Chris smiling and I turned, made everyone turn around and smile at us. <laughs> um, but they're physically disturbing the surface both above and below the water line. And so um, there's so much more to this project, but this is kind of the most exciting part because all the homeowners are out there um, kind of poking around and, you know, there's loud boats and stuff and everyone's kind of getting, becoming more aware of the idea that the jellyfish live on these plastic and, you know, hard surfaces and how we can address them at this stage. And so honestly, we need to clean up Barnegat Bay from the back end. That needs to be our main priority. But in, in this particular project, we're really just going after the symptom, which is the jellyfish, which is a manifestation, of course, of um, pollution. Um, and so I just want to show you this graphic. Um, hopefully this disappears here. Oh, no. There it is. Oh. Mm. Okay. So sorry about the little overlap. Um, but this is a life cycle of the jellyfish. And the thing you can't see behind the video is just called nephira. It's basically this floating um, egg sperm kind of union. The ephira is kind of the next life stage. And then the most important life stage you can see, which is this polyp stage. And this polyp stage is what's sticking to the hard surfaces that we're referring to. So um, the crazy thing about this particular jellyfish is they're able to reproduce in like three or four different ways they can reproduce sexually and asexually. And so they can reproduce with egg and sperm like most animals. They can also reproduce by cloning them their polyp stage from left to right. So they can literally like drop these things called podocysts and just create more um, polyps left to right on a surface. And then they can also reproduce vertically. So as you can see, this kind of thing looks like it has like a bunch more things attached to it than this one did. It's because it can clone itself off of breaking off small pieces of itself and creating more jellyfish. And even more frightening, these polyps can live on these surfaces over multiple years. So maybe one year you don't necessarily see a ton of jellyfish in your lagoon. Next year you might have you might see a bunch more. So with this project, we're hoping to see a lot longer term um, results. And so the scientists did a bunch of research before we got there, the dive team. And now the scientists are going to do research again after the dive team scrubs to see that what we're doing really makes any sense. So on to our third project. Um, we are working with 37 towns. Um, which are all 37 towns that drain into Barnegat Bay to manage stormwater. Um, and so obviously this is all kind of tied together. Stormwater is the reason for all these other projects. Um, and so working with all 37 towns, we're trying to help them manage their stormwater. And the way that we do that first is by building rain barrels with the town because it's uh, kind of our gateway uh, activity to get residents involved. And it, uh, it helps the towns because they can use the workshops on their stormwater permits for points everybody wins they can use it for their sustainable jersey points this is me looking like a crazy person in the back of a u-haul truck i was running around the watershed getting uh marine antifreeze barrels because we can reuse them for rain barrels um, and so i stuffed a bunch in a truck and dragged them over to the eco center which i'm in need of them again so if any of you have connections to local marinas definitely hook me up we reuse them and then we drill holes in them to make rain barrels. And then folks come to our rain barrel workshops. They get the presentation, uh, slightly different from this one, about rainwater and stormwater and, and different things they can do to conserve water. And then they bring it home, install it at their house. And hopefully now the resident has buy-in. But then on a larger scale, we now have 
access and connections with the municipal family. So the public works department and the folks running the town and writing or filling out the permits for the stormwater and hopefully helping them manage their stormwater better um, on a more like bureaucratic level and like sitting down and looking at like the details of how you run a town, which I pass that stuff off to the executive director. I handle the education outreach on the ground floor with our residents and our community. Um, so uh, you might have heard me reference our student grant program. Um, let's see, how do residents use stormwater? So uh, stormwater can be used, so rainwater can be used in a, from a rain barrel many different ways. Um, you can water your garden, um, you can fill a koi pond if you test the water first, uh, you can use it to wash your outdoor toys like your sailboat or your um, beach toys or anything outside, you can use it to fill your bird bath, um, you can use it to water your vegetable garden if you test it prior. So basically having a rain barrel allows you to conserve water for yourself, conserve money, and then also just prevent more stormwater from ending up in our local waterways. And so this is a picture of an outfall pipe on the left-hand side here. And so there's no filtration system because remember our wastewater and stormwater systems are separate. So our wastewater is getting filtered to some extent. Our stormwater is not getting filtered. Whatever goes in the drain on the street is coming out the other end. So what we wanna do is prevent a lot of that water from getting in the drain to begin with. And one of the ways we can do that is with a 50 gallon, gallon rain barrel. Um, you can purchase a rain barrel pre-constructed, but they're so easy to make. It just makes sense to save money and, and um, make it uh, yourself. Um, so if any of you have young people in your lives who, or just actually don't have to be young, they just have to be in an undergraduate degree. Um, they're usually young people. Uh, the undergraduate students are eligible to apply for a student grant program. And the reason I bring it up is because currently right now the applications are open and it's related to all the projects I've been sharing with you. So student grant actually participate in the jellyfish project. They participate in the rally for Barnica Bay project with the, with the poop sniffing dog. And they participate in the uh, Sedgeon Marine Conservation Zone biodiversity study, which you can see here in this picture that they're working on. Um, every single student grant is very hands-on. We pay them cash money to do science on Barnegat Bay. Um, and they get paired with a mentor. They get to add this to their resume. They get experience producing a scientific paper and doing research. Um, and so uh, the money that they get, they can use for whatever they need or want, school books or rent or whatever. We don't tell them how they have to use the money, but the applications are currently open right now. And so the people eligible to apply for this are undergraduate students who are currently enrolled in a four-year degree, or if they've just recently graduated from high school and they're, and they're accepted into a four-year degree, that's fine. Or if they're just graduating undergraduate and they like literally are just graduating this season, they're still eligible to apply in that summer of their senior year of college. Um, how and what do you test the water? So um, basically when I keep saying the word water quality, that includes a lot of parameters. So you don't see them doing that here in this picture, but water quality can be everything from its acidity or basicness like um, pH. It's the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water. It's the temperature of the water. It's the amount of bacteria in the water. Um, and so all these different things are being tested and more things and all these different things influence each other. And so the water chemistry is tested on site with tools and then some water samples are collected and brought back to our water quality lab at the eco center and looked into further under microscopes um, with some more lab equipment. And so it is occurring to me since the first time I'm giving this new PowerPoint that I forgot a very critical slide, um, which is about our brand new um, water quality um, community science opportunity. So as a regular person, you off the street can come and volunteer for us to collect water samples in and around the Tom's river for that rally project and bring it back to the lab so that scientists can look further into that water quality. So if you're interested in volunteering for that program, um, there is more info just starting to come out right now. Clean ocean action is kind of spearheading that. 
and it's happening at our lab in Tom's river, um, at St. Barnegat Bay center. So, um, yeah, there's another great opportunity to get involved in water testing. Um, so I just talked about all kinds of projects that say Barnegat Bay is working on all kinds of issues that the Barnegat Bay is facing. Um, but what are some things I didn't want to end the presentation without addressing the things that you can do, because that is the most important thing um, in on a very small scale. And I emphasize small scale. Um, you can address what's going on on your property. So a smart yard equals a healthy bay. Reduce fertilizer, pick up your dog poo, plant native plants, absorb rainwater and rain barrels and rain gardens. Reduce your energy use because atmospheric nitrogen is also a problem for our bay. Um, I didn't talk about the word nitrogen, but it's basically this nutrient that is carried to Barnegat Bay via the stormwater with fertilizer and poop and all this stuff in it. Um, and reduce plastic use is an obvious one. Um, and of course, scrub your bulkhead if you live on a lagoon where there are jellyfish. And of course, getting involved in your local community is is even more important than doing everything on your own personal lawn because community effort is what's going to create bigger change. So participating in um, uh, all kinds of events that Save Barnegat Bay has to offer and beyond that. You don't have to participate with us. We love our partners across the state and you can obviously participate with them. So if you're interested in participating with Save Barnegat Bay, if you go to our website, click the word participate in the top right corner, um, you'll see a page with all kinds of information on it. Um, our calendar is there. We have this captain's program where you can go to meetings in your municipal family and then report back to Save Barnegat Bay. You can volunteer with us. We have unpaid internships, again, for college students who might like more experience. Um, and then uh, click on the word volunteer to sign up to be a volunteer for us and you'll get all the updates that I send out weekly. Uh, for different opportunities like cleanups and and helping us maintain the eco center and scrubbing bulkheads and doing community science and lots of cool stuff. So um, and some more ways to get involved. You can obviously host a screening of Drift, which is a super educational film. It's about an hour and 10 minutes, probably by the end of it. Um, you can share our website and links with folks, share the information that I shared with you that Save Barnegat Bay is working on all these different projects and we need community support. Um, obviously, you can share the student grant and internship opportunities with college students that you might have in your life or know. Um, you can host us again for more educational talks. This talk was geared towards more of like everything Save Barnegat Bay is doing, but I can go more into the science of Barnegat Bay and the issues facing it. I did, I kind of jumped around a little bit, but I can get more nerdy about it if you want more of the science. And then I mentioned it in the last slide, but you can join our captain's program, which is basically where folks go to their municipal meetings in all 37 towns and then come back for support from Save Barnegat Bay. We teach you about the meetings and what they're for. And then we hope you go back and are a voice for your community, for yourself and for the Bay. So that includes town councils, environmental commission meetings, um, planning boards, zoning boards, basically all the groups that are making decisions about your town and how those things are impacting your life, your quality of life, and obviously our local ecosystems. And finally, if you don't have time, you might have treasure and we never turn down a donation because that is super helpful keeping our mission alive. And these amazing volunteers in the background of this picture, Ed and Marcy are helping me deal with the enormous amount of leaves inside of our fenced in area. You can see our little greenhouse on the right, on the left-hand side, our peace garden behind Marcy. Um, and so you might be wondering, well, wait a minute, Chrisanne, I thought I wasn't supposed to rake leaves because leaves are supposed to stay on the ground to encourage insects. It's true, but I live in a giant forest at the Eco Center, and if we don't rake the leaves, we will be buried next year, um, literally in leaves. Um, so we don't we don't drag them anywhere. We just put them back in the woods so that they can continue to do their important work, um, and uh, we just kind of excavate ourselves <laughs> from the leaves. Um, if you have any questions, I know I went through a ton. If you have any questions at all and you would like to reach out to me separately, please feel free to send me an email, education at savebarnegatbay.org. All of the stuff I shared and more is on our website. And of course, if you're savvy on the socials, we're on all of them. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. 
and probably more. I think I made a TikTok. I think I made a few TikToks, but I'm really not into like publishing my face on things, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, so we're on there, but share those things with folks. I'm going to leave this up actually, because you might be writing and uh, I'll take any questions if okay. anyone has them. Okay, Grace Ann, we have a procedure here. We'll people raise their hands and uh, we'll get the first one from Walt. Get the mute, please. Uh, yes. Um, my, my father, you know, who lived in Bergen County, actually put up a rain barrel for his, you know, to collect rainwater off the roof. So that was the first time I've seen that. Um, but the question I have is how and for what do you test the water for, for using it for certain applications? Um, so more specifically, uh, we use this tool called a YSI, which is an acronym for a tool that uh, collects information about the water. So it's this probe. It's basically this, this little mechanism probe thing that goes in a long wire and there's a little computer console. And so when the, when the probe goes in the water, it's testing things like um, pH, dissolved oxygen, uh, temperature, con conductivity, salinity, all the stuff that you, if you were to remove the water immediately, those things would change. And then from there, we collect a bottle of um, water and kind of put it in an airtight container, carry it back to the lab, and then put it on Petri dishes to study things like bacteria. So in the case of the Rally for Barnegat Bay project, where we're looking at um, the Tom's River specifically, we're looking at Enterococcus and E. coli, which are two strains of bacteria. Um, and they are bacteria that influence, particularly influence beach closures. So when you see that beaches are closed because of, you know, unhealthy water quality, it's not safe to swim there anymore, which happens quite often in Barnegat Bay and in Tom's River and in New Jersey. Um, when we look at those bacteria levels, we basically bring that water back to the lab and see the a number of colonies of bacteria. And then we're able to identify, like, for lack of a better way to put it, hot spots. And then when we identify those hot spots, we go after those spots again and test again and find different times to test. Because if we test when it's dry weather, we're going to get a different sample than if we test when it's wet. So when it's raining, there's going to be more stormwater, more influence from the watershed around it. And so, um, you know, there's going to be kind of different results. I think, Walt, does that answer your question? Thank you. I mean, how, how does a homeowner get to purchase one of these things? Or oh, how does a how homeowner these do that? Done? Yeah. Um, so a homeowner is not usually doing this. So, um, if you want to participate in a project that we have going on, you can absolutely participate and volunteer with us. Um, if you're a homeowner looking to test water quality, I'm not sure what water you'd be testing. Like if maybe you have a pond on your property or yeah, I'm not sure. Well, well I was talking specifically about the rainwater collected like you showed in the picture. Oh, okay. <laughs> so if you go to a Home Depot or um, a fish supply store or a pool store, depending on what kind of water you're trying to use it for, you can get it tested. So you can bring it to um, your local department store, like a Home Depot, I think, test the water for... Um, they can test the water for having vegetable gardens. Um, you can bring it to a fish store to test the water to have a koi pond. So you have to kind of pick your your segment. Never ever drink the water from a rain barrel. It's not oh, potable. No. Don't even try. Okay. So what what do those places test for? I mean, obviously not what you're testing for. Uh, well, you know, it's I mean, it's similar things. They're probably going to be looking for things like nitrogen, which I didn't mention, but we are looking for that. And they're probably looking for that different kinds of nitrogen, like nitrates and nitrites and all that fancy chemistry. Um, and uh, I don't I don't specifically know, actually, for each different thing. I don't know what's good for a koi fish versus what's good for a vegetable garden. Um, that's going to depend on on the specifics of the chemistry that I it's beyond me. Okay, thank you for your answer. No problem. Okay, Jim Blinn. Yes, thanks for very interesting talk. Um, my, I have actually two questions. One is about the, your association, if any, with the Pinelands uh, preservation kinds of organization and the Pinelands Commission. And the other is about 
algae. Yeah, so um, with algae, remember when I was like, I can get into another talk about all the nerdy stuff, I would definitely talk about algae. Um, because basically, what Jim is referring to is all the stormwater that ends up in Barnegat Bay um, creates an algae problem. So algae is naturally occurring. It's basically this organism that is kind of like a plant. It's not quite a plant, but it's, it acts like a plant. Um, and so this algae lives in the water uh, and is feeding on the excess nutrients that the stormwater has carried to it. And so when you see what's called algae blooms, you'll hear about a lot in the springtime in the news and in, you know, um, kind of media and what have you. Algae blooms are kind of that harmful aspect of the pollution problem. So um, we can get into the nerdiness to do with all the science that the stormwater causes the algae blooms and and how different species of algae can cause different um, problems in the food web and things like that. But that's for another talk. But as far as our relationship with the Pinelands Preservation Alliance and the Pinelands, we work with them constantly. Um, they are obviously uh, an organization that is feed their waterways and, and their waterways, it's everyone's, but like their kind of their space of work influences our space of work all the time. So oftentimes we work with them on um, like trying to push back a developer, for instance, I didn't talk about any of the advocacy our organization does, but um, we oftentimes are going to bat to try and slow down major developments, try to help um, protect uh, open space, try to, um, you know, go out and go after I don't like that term but like try to stop major polluters if they do exist and oftentimes we'll partner with groups like PPA to do that because they have different skill sets that we don't have and information and so on um so we definitely work with them for sure they're awesome okay. we love them yeah okay thanks <laughs> no Yay, problem. You're on. Uh, thank you for, for this uh, very informative talk um, I have a few questions about the, the jellyfish. You, mm -hmm. you spoke about the bay nettles, but um, there are two other kinds uh, that I'm wondering about. The, the little ones that, you know, the kids take in their hands and throw at each other. And they also, the, the, what we uh, recently talked about, the, the Portuguese, uh, was it the man of war? And uh, mm -hmm. so, but those, those uh, once in a while, I see one of those big ones should I take a net and get out of the bay? Um, that's my first question. Well, well, yeah. Still so questions. jellyfish, we could have another three hour conversation just about jellyfish. Um, there are <laughs> different species. There are, I mean, I'm longer, frankly. There are a lot of different species of jellyfish making their way into waterways across the world. They're moving around prolifically. And there's all kinds of studies looking at how they're moving faster and into different places and what have you. The image on the right that I've clicked on, um, this is called a comb jelly. And the gentleman here is referring to the one that the kids play with in their hand. It's not a true jellyfish. It actually doesn't have tentacles like, um, like the nettles do. Um, and so this one's safe for folks to play with and whatever. And it's, it's a drifting organism that has these kind of little hairs and it floats around and they even bioluminesce or glow in the dark at night, which is kind of fun. Um, they are part of our, um, our food chain and they can be a problem if they become too prolific, which does and can happen. Um, but they are native to Barnegat Bay and they're fine. The other one that you're referring to, um, there are not that many, um, sorry, I can't talk and spell, which I'm probably still spelling wrong, but um, this is the, you know, the kind of, you'll you'll hear a lot of people talk about the Portuguese man of war. Portuguese man of war is also not a jellyfish. It is a colony of other organisms that live together um, to create this, this kind of glob that looks like a really organized organism. <laughs> um, the likelihood that you're going to see a Portuguese man of war, I would say is pretty slim. Um, it's not impossible. I know they're here, but they're definitely not that prolific. You definitely don't want to get near them. Um, they do sting and they can be harmful. Um, but more importantly, since we're bringing up all of the horrors of the jellyfish world, I would like you to know about one that is more prolific and more dangerous. Um, this is called a clinging jellyfish. Uh, it's about the size of a dime. 
Um, this is actually probably a picture from Paul's lab, frankly, because Paul is extremely prolific. You can find him on Disney Channel and on every media station, and he just ends up everywhere. He's very a very exciting voice. Anyway, Dr. Paul Bologna studies jellyfish at Montclair State University, and this is probably a picture from his lab of these clinging jellyfish. And the reason I bring it up is because their sting can be very lethal. If you feel it in the beginning, he describes it as not feeling very strong, but then it increases in pain over time and causes this paralysis. And they are becoming much, much more prolific in Barnegat Bay. They're often most they're most often found at the beginning of the season when the water is still a little bit cool. So if you are jumping in Barnegat Bay, especially at Ticey Shoal, um, places where there's a lot of algae and eelgrass and things that they can cling to as they are clinging jellyfish, um, you might want to wear some uh, full coverage, you know, just wear those uh, kind of wetsuit cover um, skins and stuff. Uh, just to prevent any any harm that they might sting you. Once the water warms up, they die back and go into dormancy for the next year. Um, they're not supposed to be here. They're not native to our bay, but we are finding them more and more often. Um, and definitely, if you do happen to see them, which I think would be kind of hard to see because they're so tiny, um, definitely get out of the water and don't participate in that area anymore. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that answers my question. But I, there's another organism that is I've been bitten by the, it's the uh, the sea lice. Uh, I was yeah. up my uh, my floating dock, like just like you you suggested to do. That was mm -hmm. last time I cleaned my uh, floating dock, and the next day I was covered with with really ugly, nasty looking uh, uh, pimples, and that lasted about three weeks, uh, itchy, painful, and I don't know. I suspect. It's from sea lice. Is that? It? But that was the first time in many years that I go in the in the in the Barnegat Bay water. Um, yeah. Is that a problem? Um, sea lice. Um, sea lice are a thing. It's definitely a thing. Um, they're harder to. It's harder sometimes for a person like me who hasn't seen or know. Like even when I see the situation, I still can't diagnose it properly because there's a few different things that can cause that kind of reaction when you're in the water. Um, but sea lice are definitely a thing. There's also even more severe cases where there's um, uh, smaller microorganisms in the water that can cause, you know, infection or, or harm. But basically, you want to be conscious of when and where you're swimming in the water. So, you know, you can have this happen in the ocean. I'm not suggesting that, like you know, being in a big open body of water is going to prevent this 100%. But when you're jumping in these lagoons in the back of Barnegat Bay, where there's no water flow and things are, there's the water quality is a lot lower, the ecosystem can't be in balance. So where in other cases where sea lice, they're part of the food chain, right? So they're important in some ways, and things are supposed to be eating each other. But in places where the water quality is not good, things kind of swing out of balance and that's when you get more what we call like um pests i guess like jellyfish and and bacteria and things that would cause us harm so they're supposed to be a part of the ecosystem but because we've messed everything up there's more things and there's less um predators for the for the things to create a better balance so i would just be very conscious of where you're swimming um the way to know if it's okay to swim in the water is if there is a lifeguard station there. The water where a lifeguard is stationed is being tested every single week. So you know if there's a lifeguard there, the water is being tested. If there's no lifeguard there, there is not water being tested. And I would, if it's a place, it's kind of your like private swimming hole or what have you, I would not swim there immediately after a rainstorm or even a few days after a rainstorm because that's when all the bacteria from the land is making its way immediately into the water and it's gonna cause those imbalances. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Paul? Yeah, thank you so much, Grace Sam, for a fabulous presentation. I, I'm so impressed with all of the initiatives that you have, people have underway and, and apparent success and state-of-the-art things. And, and so, first of all, kudos for all of that work. But also, <laughs> I, 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 can, I assume that uh, there are many, probably most other coastal communities that are facing the same range of problems. And so I'm just wondering, uh, are you aware of other 
initiatives like yours and do you people get together at national conventions and and exchange best practices and you know i'm just curious to know yeah that's a great question and it's not often asked enough um so just to kind of kind of a real life example the poop sniffing dog version the rally for burning at bay in the toms river waterway that project was previously done by clean ocean action in the navasink river with success um so that's an example of kind of a local situation where we've all kind of worked together um there are definitely regional conferences and meetings that we all go to but frankly, at Save Barnegat Bay, we're very big at looking even bigger than local because oftentimes we kind of get these blinders on, mm -hmm. oh, we're from the Jersey Shore. The Jersey Shore is our only problem. But really the issues that we're facing here are the exact same as the ones in all the estuaries across the United States and the world. So issues that you see from Florida, like when you saw those tide problems, yes, that was really big and very severe and it's coming from a different source, but the the chemistry of what's happening, the, the water moving the pollution into the waterway is the same. And it's people that's causing that influence. So I actually have some good news to share. I received a scholarship um, and I'll be going to Vancouver, Canada next month to go to a global conference about science teachers. And I hope to meet other for informal and formal educators who do research about teaching science and so um, say Burning Bay is working on a bunch of other stuff that we're not even listing on the PowerPoint, including building resources for local educators to use in classrooms. And so we're going to be doing a presentation about a project we're working on. And then also, I hope to make amazing connections and really get like a, a, a wider view of what's happening so that we're not just doing the whole we live here and this is all that matters game. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Thank you. Hey, Grace, do you hear me? Yeah. We hear you. Do you, do you okay. Do you do, I've done kayaking with at Island Beach. Do you, your group sponsor any kayak trips? And also, do you work with friends at Island Beach State Park? Yeah, I've been to the Sedge House with them on a pontoon. Yeah. So, um, Friends of Island Beach State Park actually uses the Eco Center to have their meetings, um, which we're very proud of being able to allow folks to use our Eco Center. So, now with COVID, lightening up as I sit in quarantine. Um, <laughs> with COVID ever evolving, more folks are using the Eco Center more and more because we have an outdoor space that you can see where it's safe to meet. And then we also have an indoor space. So Friends of Island Beach and uh, Sierra Club and other groups are meeting there regularly. And then um, yes and no. We are a grassroots nonprofit, so we're working on all the stuff you see there. But I often will try to run outreach situations where I'll like I'll spark some interest and get people to go kayaking in the marine conservation zone. Um, so I don't run it. I don't do that on like a regular basis because we're working on so many different things, but it's not out of our purview. So but if you do want to go kayaking in the sedge um, sedges, I would just refer you immediately to Island Beach State Park. They run nature programs all summer long and they do it more regularly, more consistently than I do. So if it's something you want to do. I've done um, it several times. Yeah. <laughs> I also do my tune boat to the sedge house, which is really interesting. Oh my God, the Sedge House is super cool with lots of history and it, yeah, it's very, very cool. Um, I see some hands getting raised. In the... By the way, thanks. No problem. Ron, Ron, Ron Hogue. You can unmute Ron. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, you listed a whole series of different problems, issues and so forth. Uh, could you give us some idea as to which one of these you think is the most serious which one are you concerned most about yeah so uh, kind of in these conversations that we're having kind of on a global scale is that we need to go after all <laughs> solutions because there are so many issues that people are causing for our local area but in our local spaces but in barnegat bay specifically our biggest issue issue is stormwater currently because that is the vehicle by which nitrogen is making its way into the bay and nitrogen is the leading cause of the imbalances that we see so nitrogen is a nutrient that exists on the land it exists in the water and it exists naturally but what's happening is because there's so many people and so many what we call impervious surfaces we're again creating that imbalance so whereas nitrogen was naturally occurring 
when there's too much after a rainstorm uh, or too much bacteria in that case, which is being carried there by the stormwater as well, that's why we see low water quality. And so this overdevelopment of all these spaces is cause is causing more stormwater. So when when someone asks me, well, which one is the one you want to focus on? Well, it's stormwater. But the way to address stormwater is through development, right? So it's kind of like it's kind of like the biggest issue is is stormwater, but we can't stop the rain. We're not going to change the rain, but we can change how we develop the land that accepts the rain. And so then that kind of turns back into talking about um, development and water testing and things like that. Thank you. Uh, how much of the contribution to uh, nitrate loads is caused by fertilizer? Lawn fertilizer. It's a great question. We don't know. We don't know, but um, we're pushing. Save Barnegat Bay is the type of group where we don't have a lot of science that happens in house, but often we'll push on larger entities to do better science. And so one of the things we've been asking the DEP for years is to create a total maximum daily load or a TMDL, which is basically a standard for how much nutrients is allowed to be kind of, you know, d you know, pushed into Barnegat Bay from various sources, be it the whatever, the stormwater being the main one, but any other sources. And they have not yet come up with a TMDL despite our pushing for years. And so we're a grassroots organization, we can do as much as we can do, but we have to push on these larger entities to do what they're supposed to do, which is often what our purpose is. And so we've been asking for a TMDL because we want to know where, you know, what's the night, which thing is the nitrogen coming from? And so fertilizer is likely a huge amount of it being the kind of, you know, space that we, that we host here in our watershed. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not to say we're not getting nitrogen pollution from other spaces in New Jersey that's coming in our inlets through. D David Hogan's. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Uh, this past summer, um, I had gone down to uh, Tuckerton uh, Seaport and um, we're with a group of friends. We were staying at the Pirate Cove uh, campground. And from there, you can do some kayaking and uh, I was quite amazed, um, you know, going through the uh, little canals and whatnot, how, how many clams and I guess the fiddler crabs. Um, I mean, I, I was amazed. There had to be millions and millions of clams. So I guess those are placed there by people or? Uh, so in Tuckerton, I would argue more likely those animals are there because they're thriving. Um, those animals are found across all of Barnegat Bay. Um, but if you're seeing them prolifically, I'm going with for those two organisms, it's probably not such a bad thing. Um, oh, no, grab, no, right, right. Yeah, so they, they're there naturally, actually. So there is a group called Reclaim the Bay and there's oyster growers and there's all kinds of folks who are, are making, who are causing changes and like creating some anthropogenic or human impact on those ecosystems and changes in the populations and what have you. But if you saw them in that quantity, it's probably because they're naturally thriving there and the Southern Bay is experiencing different problems altogether than the Northern Bay. And so the Southern Bay, and even is slightly different in its in its kind of makeup as far as the kind of water is concerned, slightly. Um, so those animals being there sounds like really good news. And that reminds me, I didn't say this as something you can do to help Barnegat Bay. It's eat oysters and clams. When you go to the restaurant, ask. I ask the waiter all the time, I'm such a pain in the butt, ask the waiter where the shellfish come from and ask them for the Barnegat Bay specific shellfish and say, I'd like to order the ones from the Barnegat Bay growers or at least New Jersey, at least New Jersey. Delaware Bay has a lot of its own oysters that are awesome and, and delicious. So when you go to restaurants or go to the local fish markets, you know, skip Costco, skip Walmart, skip ShopRite if you can. I mean, I, I'm, I'm guilty. I go to ShopRite, but like try to go to the local fish market and buy the local, um, by the local fish and enjoy enjoy that bounty because eating it supports the local economy that cleans up the bay. Right. Hey, Gracie, I do have a question for you. You mentioned an awful lot about the uh, 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 nitrogen pollution, but isn't phosphorus pollution every much a, a bit of a problem? Yeah, 
Yeah. So um, nitrogen and phosphorus are kind of the two bad guys. I often don't bring up phosphorus, not because it isn't a problem, but because when I'm doing a talk, I try not to like overburden the talk with like all this chemistry and, and high level science because I don't want to lose you um, because you might be an accountant. And if you talked about accounting things, I'd get lost. So, um, so I try not to bring it up. But anyway, yes, phosphorus and nitrogen are kind of both bad guys. And actually in the northern part of Barnegat Bay, nitrogen is the big culprit. And actually in the southern part of the bay, phosphorus can also be a really bad culprit for slightly different reasons. Um, there's some kind of hypotheses about why that is, but it's just basically, again, the makeup of the Southern Bay is a slightly different and the hydrology is a little bit different. Um, but the sources of phosphorus are also slightly different than the sources of nitrogen. So yes, they're all a problem. Blanket statement, yes, you're correct. But I don't talk about it that much because nitrogen is the one that like as a homeowner, you, you're, you're, and the bacteria and everything in the poop, it's just, a lot more of its nitrogen. Um, so if you are addressing fertilizer use specifically, um, you are going to see nitrogen and phosphorus listed on the bag of fertilizer. Go after slow release nitrogen in the product. If you have to buy it and you insist on using it, go after slow release because that stuff is going to dissolve slower. And those chemicals like nitrogen and phosphorus are going to make their way into the waterway a lot slower, if at all. Um, as opposed to stuff that immediately just disperses all over your lawn. Great. Thank you very much. Since no there are no further questions, uh, Roger, it's up to you. Great, Sam. Uh, two things. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I want you to know, you may not have been with the group when they had a uh, meeting that I was at and I signed, I actually think I repeated and took an oath that I would only use slow release nitrogen fertilizers. And I have a, a plaque that I have hanging on the uh, bulkhead down at the beach that says, I'm a Barnegat Bay buddy. And yes. That's what, that's what that is, okay. That but, program existed before I was around. I think I was in high school still. Yep, yeah, well, I was around. <laughs> and that's perhaps back when I found the, uh, say, Barnegat Bay at the uh, uh, sea, sea Day, Conservation Day at Ocean County College, where I, I attended a, a very, good presentation from Willie DeCamp, the founder or one of the founders of the group. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, since I was age 15, I have truly enjoyed the Bay. My family bought a little, one of those little plywood tent houses down there in uh, 1956, which came with a big old rowboat and a mighty seven horse outboard motor. And I thought I went to heaven. I was all over that Bay in that seven horse. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, later on, I've had two, three more boats. And when I retired, I bought a big sailboat, which uh, I really enjoyed. Uh, but uh, I got a little too old to handle it. So it's uh, sold it to a young fellow. Uh, your talk was great. Only thing I'd say is uh, slow down. You, you take a breath. <laughs> you, just really, you really want to, you wore us all out. Okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, we, we have two ways to thank you. And uh, the first we will flip, put on the screen. There we go. It's a certificate of appreciation from the Summit Old Guard. You notice Thank the orchid in the lower part of it. Uh, that's there because uh, Summit, which is our founding town, uh, in 1930 was an orchid capital of the United States. Uh, and uh, if you had been in person, we would have given you an orchid, presented you with an orchid. <laughs> but perhaps that'll have to wait. Uh, Thank you. Uh, stay well, by the way. And our second way of thanking you is the Old Guard salute. Gentlemen. Okay. Roger, thank you very much. And uh, Grace Ann, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you for your dedication and your passion. And uh, you, I, you, may be, you may be pleased to learn that uh, during your talk, you, you broke the triple digit barrier and you had a hundred participants listening to your talk. So uh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you guys.